you, Renee. And good morning, all. I hope that you're wide awake at this point. Well, that's not too promising a response. <laughs> we'll do the best that we can. <laughs> But yeah, it's very good, as always, to have an opportunity just to sit down and share some things together. Uh, today, you know, I come, as, as Renee says, I come from the United States. Since I've been here, I've met people from uh, Chile, of course, New Zealand, India. You know, we come from a lot of different places. Uh, today, we're going to talk about one of the things that we do, in fact, have in common. <laughs> we're going to be talking about death and dying. So wherever it is that we come from, I think we can all be pretty sure, especially since we have some grounding in theosophy, that there is this one shared destination <laughs> that we are in fact, <laughs> Barbara's in the crowd, <laughs> that we are in fact headed toward at some point during this little brief span that we have. So I want to go into that because, you know, quite frankly, if it's something that we're aware of, you know, much like we woke up this morning, we were aware that we had to get to this space to do something. In, with that particular knowledge, it enabled us to do the things we needed to do, to put on the proper outfits, to take care of our nourishment, to make sure we had hydrated so that we could sit and last through listening to this fellow talking this morning. We planned ahead based on some sort of foreknowledge. You don't know what's going to be said, but you know what it takes to get you there. Similarly, you know, with anything that we have some sort of uh, awareness or knowledge about, the intelligent person doesn't just turn away but actually turns to it to try and figure out how it is that we approach this thing. So anyway, a lot of things have been said about death. A couple of things that I like in particular. Um, death has been described as an incurable, terminal, sexually transmitted disease. <laughs> It's like it spreads to everyone. I had a dentist when I was a young person. I was like 14 years old. He was one of these people who had like a dry sense of humor. You never quite knew what Dr. Scheuer was going to say when you walked in. I remember walking in one time. He said, you know, you're taking science classes in school, right? I said, yeah. He said, did they teach you that uh, oxygen is poisonous? You know, I think, how could that be? You know, we all breathe oxygen. He says, right, and who lives? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, a consideration of it would be worth our while. So we talk about death, what is it? And you know, one of the things that we can talk about, death is a biological phenomenon. Our, from our perspective. It's a biological phenomenon. It relates to something that happens with a physical organism in its process. So basically what happens is that the heart stops. After a certain amount of time, the brain becomes starved of oxygen. The brain ceases to function, and at that point they pronounce you as dead. It used to be that it was the heart stopping. But of course, maybe we'll talk a little bit about that later on, but that became a bad standard because too many people whose hearts stopped, pronounced dead, had this thing called a near-death experience, returned, and then they had to move the line for what was considered actually the moment that we die. So it's a biological phenomenon. And actually, it's something that happens in stages. So even after the heart stops, the brain stops, the stomach keeps on digesting food. You know, whatever your meal was, it'll be working on it for the next 24 hours. Your hair and your nails continue to grow long after you're under the ground. 
Of course, for those of you who are cremated, that's not true. <laughs> but otherwise, that's what happens. The blood remains completely viable for another 24 hours as well. So there are these stages in this life process. This overriding principle which animated this whole function departs, but aspects of it continue. So in spiritual traditions of the world, one of the things that is a very strong focus is this idea that we have to come to grips with this universally shared phenomenon. You just have to do it if you're ever really going to uh, embrace something that you would call a spiritual path. And so, particularly I'm familiar with the Tibetan tradition. They're very clever in a lot of the things that they do. And so what they do is they do these things where they say there are these three points that they ask you to consider about death. And you, know, you think it through for yourself, and if you find it's incorrect, fine. But think it through and work through to your own answer. So the first thing that they would say is, uh, think about this one, death is certain. And so on your own, you know, is that true? Okay, you start thinking, who is it that we know that has not ever died. And you go down the list, you know, grandparents are gone. You know, at a certain stage, parents are gone. You look at the great spiritual giants, Jesus is gone, Buddha died. You know, the same process affects everyone. I do recall one time being with a group and I, you know, asked someone to think about it. And, I said, okay. And so I said, who is it that you know who has never died? And someone put their hand up. <laughs> and I really wanted to hear what the answer was. Who was this person that is the exception? And so when I called him, they said, who is it? He said, uh, Elvis, Elvis Presley. <laughs> he had just seen him in Las Vegas just a couple of weeks before. That one might not be so accurate. <laughs> but everybody experiences this. So then the idea is that based on this sort of awareness, how should I behave? So the second thing they ask you to consider is this, that the time at which this transition occurs, while the occurrence of it is certain, the time and the moment when it will occur is uncertain. And then you think that through. Is that true? And you know, one of the unfortunate features of uh, making our way through this life is that we find that it is true. That it's not based on age. It's not based on health. You know, there are people who walk out of here as fit as a fiddle and a brick falls off a building. And, you know, unexpectedly, they're gone. So while the fact of it is certain, the time at which it will occur is uncertain. There's no, no way to predict. And so they ask you to think about that. And when you think about that, then of course, the preciousness of each moment is the thing that kind of bears down into our awareness that, you know, something's waiting for me up ahead, but, you know, I know I've got this moment, how do I use it? These, I mean, these are the ideas that this thing is intended to cause to arise within us. And then the third thing that they will say, it's really sort of a question. At the moment that this transition occurs, what is it that will be of the most value to you. And, you know, go down the list. All right, you know, I've worked a lifetime to become financially secure. Is it my money? And then you think it through and no. I don't know what the uh, similar thing is in New Zealand, but in America, every business 
know, when they have cash being taken or being delivered, there's a company called Brinks, the Brinks Company. And they have the big armored trucks that they pick up the cash and deliver the cash. One of the things they say is that you have never seen a Brinks truck following a funeral procession. <laughs> so maybe money's not it. You know, at that moment, that won't be the thing that's most helpful. Well, then people say, well, you know, I've built a good name in the community. Maybe it's my name, my reputation. And, you know, you figure that through, and that probably doesn't do a lot of good. My friends, my family, as much as they may love us, as much as they may have been a part of our life and a help to us, nobody is going to go along with us. They're not going anywhere. They've got their lives to live. Then you go down to even the one, the only one, who has been there with you through everything, and there is one, that one, your very body, that's the very thing that's breaking down. That's the very thing, that's the house that you're leaving. And so, you know, what is it that is of value when this moment arises? And so, this is really the culmination of these three questions, you know, these three considerations. Because what would be presented is this, that at the moment that we pass, at the moment that this universal phenomenon occurs, the only thing that will be of value at that moment is the degree of our own spiritual development or our, the depth of our spiritual experience. That's the thing that will be of the greatest assistance in meeting and in navigating this transition in consciousness. You know, which, from the theosophical perspective, we always, you know, there is this idea that's put forward quite strongly that you know, death is an illusion in the sense of being something final. I mean, if I were to ask you now, what is the opposite of death? What's the opposite of death? Anyone? Life. Right. So some people say life is the opposite of death. That's kind of the training. That is, if with death, life ends. But actually, birth is the opposite of death. Both of them are incidents which repeatedly occur in an ongoing life. You know, the life part is unending. The births and the deaths are many, and they repeat. So my discussion today is about the habit of dying. It's not about the moment, although, well, of course, we'll talk about that, but the habit. And, you know, if we elevate our conversation. Obviously, there's a biological component to death and to dying. But obviously, during the course of any life, there are a thousand minor deaths that occur. Losses of a thousand different types. You know, divorce. Something within us that was alive and flourishing crashes and dies loss of employment, loss of loved ones, all of these different things we're quite aware of. And the experience is very much like a mini version of this more final seeming event. So countless opportunities for practice, and we'll talk about that as well. So anyway, death biological, what about dying? Because it's a different thing. Dying is a psychological phenomenon. It's a process. It's a process that we engage in and that completely envelops our psyche. In fact, there's a great woman. I don't think she's, she's no longer alive. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, 
who you know really took great advances in this kind of uh, approach to uh, the study of death and dying. And so she's the one who developed these five stages in this process of dying that are very widely accepted and widely recognized because they have great validity. And again, if we think about these things, we find its validity for ourselves. The five stages that she identifies are these. That you know, in the beginning, for someone who has been given a terminal prognosis, the very first response is denial. This can't be true. You know, you go and you see the doctor, today you walk in, you're eating an apple, you're doing everything right, and then it's like, oh, uh, bad news, six months, or whatever it is that they tell you. I used to work in hospice for a number of years, so you get a chance to actually witness many of these things uh, at play. But, so the very first response, denial. This can't be true. And with that sense of denial, as with anything that we put up a wall, it results in a sense of isolation. We find ourselves walled within this sphere where we just don't want anything to break in on us. And that's stage one. The next thing is this stage she talks about where people get angry. You know, it's the thing of, why me? You know, I've been a good person. Or even if I wasn't, why me? It doesn't make any difference, really. Why me is the question. What, how is this universe set up that this weight can fall on me at this time? And so that's the uh, second stage, the stage of anger. Then they talk about how it goes into another phase, which is a phase of making a bargain. It's time to make a deal. You know, I recognize. OK, I said, why me? Because I'm such a good person. I recognize maybe I'm not the best person. And I promise I will not miss a church service if I can just get out from under this. I will attend every meeting of my Theosophical Lodge <laughs> if you'll just let me walk away from this. You know, let's make a deal here. You know, this is the wor real world. We do deals here. <laughs> so there's this bargaining stage. And, you know, sometimes it's something that doesn't, that doesn't take effect. And then the next stage they talk about is a sense of depression, where all is lost. But there comes this fifth stage, frequently there comes this fifth stage, which is a stage of acceptance. And it's a stage that can be truly beautiful, where the resistance, the energies of the consciousness that are focused on resisting what is, are released. And we allow all of the many things, the reality in which, within which we live, to break in upon us. And everyone, I've seen it when, in hospice care. It's a remarkable thing that sometimes happens where two weeks before a person is about to transition, I've seen people who have lived very messy lives, you know, who had children that they abandoned and relationships that they broke and ways where they behaved badly, people they didn't care for, you know, they shut out of their lives, where in this final phase, there is this possibility for a release, for a forgiveness, for a letting go, for putting things into a proper perspective that really becomes beautiful. So much so that as this final moment approaches, they can walk away without grasping to the many sort of hatreds and angers and irritations and requirements that were unmet that they had carried through an entire lifetime. You can walk away lightly. So this is this, these five stages. So, 
the way in which we interact with these things is really largely determined by what we could call our world view. What it is, how it is that we see the world. And in our particular time, there's some really strong problems that uh, find their way into this process. One of which being that you know, in the past, it was the view of the uh, religions of the world that held sway in your activities. You know, very often your religion dictated your view of the world. You know. And so the world got to be kind of a magical place where there generally was some higher beings and you know, codes of ethics and morality that we had to live up to. At this point, you know, the religion of this moment is more so the religion of science. Anybody who is trying to get an answer for something Generally, the place you turn first is not the local priest, as it used to be. But now it's the voice of whoever it is that's wearing the white coat and has the experimental data that they can present. So part of the difficulty with that is that while it can give many answers to certain areas, it's focused on the realm of matter which is exactly the realm that you're leaving from. And so the pr big problem is consciousness, which is primary, is not something that can be, it's not verifiable in scientific terms. It can be witnessed through its action through matter, but it can't be measured, it can't be quantified, and so what ends up happening is that when the physical organism ceases, consciousness is thought to have ceased. Because there's no place it can be tracked. It can't be measured any further. Its effects are no longer visible. And so what it does is, because from the perspective of the religion of the day, the scientific view, there is no evidence for the continuation of consciousness. In fact, the evidence would say that consciousness is annihilated with the annihilation of its vehicle. So it sets up a certain fear in many people. You know, I mean, quite honestly, there, it is, there are a couple of fears that are said to be, uh, when people list their fears. Generally, the fear of dying is at the top. For some strange reason, the fear of public speaking is the second. <laughs> Where that comes from. And probably with that, it's not even the fear of public speaking. It's probably more the fear of standing in front of people and possibly being rejected. The fear of rejection, I think, is what it is more so than the fear of standing up on a stage. They will say something wrong or you know, I have to say, my daughter used to come when she was able. When she was younger, she used to come when I would be speaking, and she'd sit. She'd like to sit in the front row, and uh, you know, she. I'd always say something about her when during the talk. She she loved it, but she played like she hated it. <laughs> but I remember I was there one time, and she's doing this, and I realized that my fly was open. <laughs> And it's like, you know, these are the sorts of things that set up these fears of standing, standing in front of people, you know? Like, just anything can happen. But you know, fear of dying is one thing that you have. And Aristotle made this statement that I think bears truth, that what we fear, we will hate. What you fear, you will hate. And if you track it through, you know, I know people who are afraid of spiders or afraid of cockroaches. And if you think about it, for those people, when a spider comes in the room, you know, they're not the ones who are going to put a glass over it and put a paper under it and take it gently outside. You know, that fear has other implications for eight-legged creatures. So similarly, 
you know, we have, there is this fear. And one of the problems we have had over a lifetime is that we have this sense that we must be in control. There's a requirement to control. And one of the problems with this whole dying experience is that all of these material controls get stripped away. So that's something that, you know, doesn't look good to our worldview. You know, I can't control this process. You, you think about it, it's not true for other, uh, other societies, but for Western society, what are the avenues that we have that permit for a socially acceptable loss of control? Loss of self-control. Now, probably I could put it in a more correct way. What are the avenues that permit for a loss of the controlling self, which we require? Now, we require rooms that are the exact right temperature. We've got to control this environment, no matter what it is outside. You, know, you come here, there are very straight streets that come. There'll be like a little device hanging over each corner, and it has lights on it that change. You know, if it turns red, you don't even have to think about it. Your foot's moving from one side to the other. You're stepping on the brake. If a little green light comes on, you're moving again. You know. This whole control has its, has its limits. And in Western societies, we don't have avenues. The closest thing that I can think of where a loss of a self-control is permissible is in the sports world. You know, and that's mainly all these guys who probably never even played the sport. Somebody kicks a goal and they're screaming and hugging each other and shaking and jumping in ways that would not be permissible in the office. <laughs> but you know, at that moment, these are the only sort of avenues that we have, we don't have, we have not allowed for the loss of the controlling self in ecstatic dance, as is the case with Sufi dance. In the American Indian, the Native American tradition, there is the vision quest, which is a part of any person's coming of age, where they go into a place that is not in the wild and natural world. They fast, they sing, and they await a vision. You know, something that will show to them the course of their coming life. And it all is not through a controlled and manipulated environment, which we insist upon. You know, you have the walkabout more close to home. You have all of these different avenues that traditionally have permitted this awareness that we live in a universe of which we are a small, small part, but within which we partake completely when we're able to loosen these boundaries. And this is the beauty of coming to, coming to grips with this whole dying process. So what is it that dies? And so, theosophical perspective, clearly what it is that dies is the personality. And it's very clearly defined in theosophical terms. There is a body and its etheric components. There is an emotional nature. And there is a lower mental quality, a mind that is turned and focused on the things of this world that the body is departing. That's what it is that dies. And of course, it dies in its stages as well. The physical is the one that we point to and say death has occurred. But of course, after that happens, there's still something that remains of this personality. You know, very often it used, people used to talk about going to the, uh, going by the graveyards and they'd see ghosts, you know, they'd see little misty things. And you know, the etheric component that aspect of the energy body of the human being that just 
you know, just extends slightly beyond the physical body, it decays at a slightly different rate. So that's present around these places for a brief time. The emotions and the thoughts, they turn out to be these things that are described as these shells that are frequently encountered in seance sorts of affairs, where you have you know, people getting in touch with the spirit of the departed, and the departed is talking about things that happened in their lives from this basis of emotion and lower memory. And that too decays at its rate. So there's this actual progressive rate. You know, just because the body supposedly dies, then it's the etheric component that decomposes, then it's the emotional uh, and lower mental that it gradually dissolves as well. So the death process is the process of this leaving behind this personality for this relatively brief or relatively long stay in some sort of heaven world before returning. That's the process. Okay. So that being the case, what is it that actually is going on? What's happening at the moment that we're passing? And there are a number of perspectives that this can be looked at from. Uh, it's something that has become very much of an exact sort of study in various traditions. I know specifically in the uh, Tibetan tradition. It's something that is uh, very finely analyzed. They have their particular point of view, but I share elements of that just because it relates very closely to what we could call a theosophical point of view as well. One of the things it said is that in the stage of passing, you know, what we witness, I mean, even in you know, hospice care, even with our own the uh, incidents that we have encountered in our own lives with our own loved ones and friends. There is this gradual withdrawal that takes place. And the senses themselves close down, you know, one by one. So gradually, you know, the vision, that sense fades. So can't see people necessarily in the room. You know, the sense of smell, the sense of taste, that goes away. The sense of touch fades as well. They say hearing is the last. And so very often they say, if you're with someone, speak to them. Because even though there's no res apparent response, they hear. And of course, Equally true, because of the interiorization of consciousness, also much more receptive just to the mental projection of thought. You can speak through your mind and it can be heard as well. But this hearing is something that uh, is said to remain. So you speak and they hear. From the Tibetan point of view, they have very clear signs that you look for. And because it's happening outwardly and it's happening inwardly. So for the person to whom it is happening, it's something that they would even encourage. This is as a practice that can be a daily practice, this practice of withdrawal. So uh, they think of it in terms of the elements. So in Tibetan cosmology, there are five elements, you know, earth, water, uh, fire, air, and space. So one by one, there's this withdrawal, the earth element, which is the most dense, most physical, there's a withdrawal. The uh, water element, you know, so there's signs that would be pointed out. And then they say there are also things that you see. At a certain point, you see like a sparks in the air. 
At another point, you see something they describe as like a butter lamp sputtering. Obviously, this is quite cultural, uh, culturally based images because I don't, I don't, I've never had a butter lamp sputtering or not in my home. So the idea being that there is something that uh, occurs along this line. And so this idea that going through and seeing the different signs. And you know, one by one, these elements withdraw. And ultimately, they withdraw into the heart, into the heart center. So the totality of the consciousness becomes centered in the heart. And even at the moment when the breathing ceases, they would say that the conscious participation continues. And so from that tradition, even after a normal you know, Western doctor would have said, pronounced someone as dead, they would say they're not dead yet, and don't disturb the body. <coughs> Ideally, they would say for three more days, particularly if it's someone who has been some sort of spiritual practitioner during their time, then they can actually uh, dwell in that space over that time period. And only then does the actual departure of this uh, conscious element occur. And they would say, ideally, it's something that comes out. It leaves the body from some upper portion of the body. So the head, the heart, something like that. So these are the ideas uh, that are most prevalent in that particular tradition. And so what they would encourage based on all of this, I mean, this is an analysis of an end point. And you know, for many traditions, the idea is there that in many ways that everything we do now is something of a preparation for that. Because that determines what direction we go from there. You know, Krishna, I think it was, that said that uh, you know, at the parting moment, you know, whatever has been our most prevalent thought is the direction that we go in. And so the idea really becomes, you know, what is it that is our prevailing thought? Not just, you know, not at the end point. Very often they use these things to encourage people to think about it now. That uh, what is it that is our prevailing thought. And so this is the thing that we have a great deal of control over. You know, we may not have control over the occurrences toward the end, but we have a great deal of control over how it is we will choose to spend our life energies during the time that we are here. What are the things that we tend to turn our minds toward? And obviously, one of the things that is uh, key, you know, we have to kind of think in terms of all of the various things that we find ourselves just attached to. So many things. And you know, most of it just relates to ourselves, our, the identities that we embrace. So finding a way to loosen our grasp on that. You know, we can be. Kiwis to our heart of hearts. We don't have to give any of that up. But we also can hold it a little bit lightly. You know, the fact that I'm American does not necessarily mean that if my country in a particular moment is opposed to people in Vietnam, that my Americanness requires me to be angry at these people I don't even know. You know, yes, we support all that is good, all that's true, all that's beautiful, and we focus on that. But we also define it for ourselves. And so this is one of part, of part of the practice. In every tradition, there is this idea of great beings, you know, great ones who have come and who have tried to show a direction for humanity, 
who have lived a life among us, given teachings, and more so exemplified the path that they came to demonstrate by the lives that they lived. And all of them leave traces. The greatest of them, you know, their memory persists for thousands of years, such as a Buddha or such as a Jesus. And their example persists for thousands of years. And for many people who have some attraction to that type of a life, a life that has this kind of openness that embraces all beings, that really reflects this intellectual idea we have of a oneness in the reality of the way they have lived, which makes them also a healing presence wherever they go. So many people find themselves attracted to that. And as part of a meditation practice, or as part of a practice of prayer, very often it stimulates that to root it in our vision of one of these uh, great ones. Uh, it's something that can provide a fuel for that. And so, in the beginning, in the middle, at the end, we find our prevailing thought is the master of the wisdom, is Mother Mary, is Buddha. And even the calling to mind the images of this cause some sort of inspirational uplift. And we find ourselves drawn to that. So these are just you know, day to day sorts of approaches that can be helpful. In every spiritual practice, there are mantras or there are prayers that are said. The two are very similar, often they're the same, mantra and prayer. I'll share one with you. It, draw, it comes from the uh, Christian tradition. I think it's also used, a, a version of it is also used even in the liberal Catholic Church. Uh, but it's something that I think has this type of uh, inherent capacity for liberation, if rightly engaged with, if rightly understood, and if deeply experienced. I'll share the words with you. We'll walk through it maybe a little bit. And I just offer it to you as perhaps something that might be uh, perhaps even attractive to you in whatever your practice may be. Um, I should say, because it draws from the Christian mystical tradition, there is the word about God. So if that's something that doesn't speak to your background and your tradition, that can be transposed for something that does. But the prayer is, O God, unto whom all hearts lie open, unto whom desire is eloquent, from whom no secret thing is hidden, Purify the thoughts of my heart with the outpouring of your spirit, that I may love you with a perfect love and praise you as you deserve. To me, having taken the time to try to live within this, this is something that is powerful. The idea, first of all, of that which is omnipresent, omniscient, to the point that not just my heart and its contents, some of which we may think of as being a little bit sullied or a little bit dark. O oh God, unto whom all hearts lie open like the pages of an open book is a liberating thought. Unto whom desire is eloquent. You know, this thing that we very often put down, try to suppress, our very desires behind which stand will. 
unto whom these utterings of the heart speak eloquently, however poorly we may express it, is a liberating thought. Purify, you know, there's a request, purify the thoughts of my heart, not the little musings on the weather or not the musings on why did she wear the same dress I did or why, you know, whatever, those sorts of things. Purify the thoughts that emanate from my heart and how with the outpouring of your spirit. You know, with, we gave the example the other day of the water, the puddle and the water. The thoughts are purified with the washing across us of this universal consciousness within which we live, move, and have our being. Purify the thoughts of our heart with that outpouring. Why? That I may love you with a perfect love and praise you as you deserve. What is the praise that is deserving to that which is without limits, to that which is present and resident in the hearts of every being? What is the praise? Is it something we can murmur out of our mouths? Is it something we can repeat in the proper formula and it makes it acceptable? I think that praise might be the simple recognition of the fact of this indwelling presence, first of all, as I experience it in my own heart, and then as I open my eyes and experience it in the hearts of all living beings. May all beings have happiness. We're going to go into this tomorrow. May all beings be free from suffering. They're no different than me. So anyway, you know, we've been talking about death, we've been talking about dying, but mainly we've been talking about living life in this moment. And that's the thing that prepares for whatever it is that comes. You know, if in fact we don't die, it prepares for that. So how do we live life in this moment? And so I offer this uh, simple prayer. There may be elements of it that may be useful. And if so, you know, focus on those. But focus on something, because it is important. And so probably that's about what I have in me for this morning, so. <laughs> I do, as always, appreciate you.